Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com. Making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. You're listening to episode 194 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about Dr. Stephen Greer and his efforts to summon aliens to interact with humans. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Stephen Greer is a medical doctor who's taken a strong interest in UFOs and alien contact. For years, he's been a leader in the disclosure movement that seeks to have the U.S. government reveal what it knows about extraterrestrials. He's also warned that the government is taking a sinister, hostile attitude toward the friendly aliens, and that the government is suppressing alien tech that could power our civilization and save the world. Most dramatically, he says he's leading an unapproved extra-governmental effort to contact the aliens and conduct diplomacy with them on behalf of the human race. According to Greer, ordinary humans can learn to summon aliens, guide UFOs to them, and have positive, productive experiences. So who is this Dr. Greer? Are the aliens really friendly? And can we really summon aliens and have UFOs appear? Well, that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, today is a special patron episode. Yes, uh, Major Randy Warren is of the U.S. Army is one of our patrons, and he uh, donated at a level that let him pick a topic, and he wanted to pick Dr. Stephen Greer. So that's who we're going to be talking about today. We want to thank uh, Major Warren for his support and also for his service to our country. Yes, thank you, Major Warren. So, Jimmy, who is Dr. Stephen Greer? Uh, Dr. Stephen Greer was born in 1955 in Charlotte, North Carolina, and he reports that when he was around eight or nine years old, so that would be 1963 or 1964, he saw an unidentified flying object and it sparked his interest in ufology. He also claims that when he was 17 in early 1973, uh, he clinically died and had a near-death experience like the ones we discussed back in episode 27. He claims that this experience left him without a fear of death as he realized it was not the end of his existence. Greer states that after his near-death experience, he learned to meditate. Uh, Being from North Carolina, Greer was raised in a Christian culture, so you'll hear him referring to Christian concepts like God, but he apparently was trained in transcendental meditation, which is based on Eastern religions, so you'll also hear him referring to Eastern religious concepts like chakras, which are understood to be centers of spiritual energy within the human body. He, cl- he claims that in October of 1973, when he was 17 or 18, he had an unusual experience while meditating. As he states in his 2020 documentary, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. I was sitting up on a mountain up in North Carolina, and right before sunset, I looked over towards the southwest and I saw a beautiful silver disc, seamless. So I said, oh, well, they're back. I didn't think much more about it. So I sat to meditate and I went into this very deep meditation. By the time I came out of the meditation, it was very pitch dark. A thought was sent into me and it said, behold, what a beautiful universe God has made. And with that, I went right into the state of consciousness that I was in, in the near-death experience. And at that instant, I became aware that there was sort of a glow, an energy field right below the the peak and through the forest. I thought it was a deer standing on its hind legs and it had these beautiful deer-like eyes. And I realized it wasn't a deer and it actually appeared and then dematerialized, came over and touched me on the right shoulder. At that instant, I vanished off the mountaintop onto the ship and then we were bang, almost instantly out in space. So at that point, I stayed in this meditative state and was teaching the ETs what it was like to be in that state of consciousness, but also be a a boy, a young man on Earth. They were very interested in this. And then we kind of merged together in our meditation 
and I created with them this protocol for making contact with them. Surprisingly, Dr. Greer did not think much about the appearance of the flying silver disc since he'd already seen such a ship some years earlier, and so he went back to meditating. He reports seeing a deer-eyed alien that is apparently meant to be an extraterrestrial uh, with large dark eyes like the gray aliens are often reported to have. It's not clear, at least 100% to me, whether Greer claims to have been physically transported on board the UFO or if he was mentally there or if he even knows which happened. However, he continued meditating and was able to establish a protocol for contacting these aliens. And this would become extremely important for his later career. Was he able to use this protocol for contacting aliens in the future? According to Greer, he was able to use it two years later while he was in France in 1975 or 76, uh, and he contacted aliens in a way that was witnessed by other people, he says. This would be the first of what he calls close encounters of the fifth kind, or CE5 experiences. So let's take a moment to look at that terminology. What is a close encounter and what are the different numbers attached to them mean? Well, the close encounter terminology was introduced by the astronomer and ufologist J. Allen Hynek in his 1972 book, The UFO Experience, A Scientific Inquiry. We've mentioned Hynek in previous episodes and we'll certainly talk about him in future ones. Hynek sorted UFO reports into two basic categories, distant encounters and close encounters. He then divided both of these categories into three subcategories for a total of six. People tend to focus on the three close ones, but there are actually six. And how did Hynek distinguish whether something should be classified as a close rather than a distant encounter? He writes, The dividing line is not very sharp, but close encounter cases are those in which the objects were sighted at sufficiently close range, generally less than 500 feet, to be seen as extended areas rather than as near points, and so that considerable detail could be noted about them. So if the UFO was less than about 500 feet away so that you could see clear detail rather than just a small object or a blurry light, it would be a close encounter. People aren't usually familiar with the three types of distant encounters. What are they? The first uh, are nocturnal lights, just the typical reports of distant lights in the night sky. Next, the second type of distant encounter was daylight disks, which were UFOs seen in the daytime, often with the shape of a disk or oval. And the third kind of distant encounter were radar visual reports, where radar confirmed the existence of something in addition to what the human eye saw. So the first three encounters are distant sightings involving either nocturnal lights, daylight craft, or radar returns. And what about the three close encounter categories? Close encounters of the first kind involve seeing a UFO close up, so seeing them at a distance of 500 feet or less. So they're not just distant lights or shapes in the sky. Close encounters of the second kind involve not only seeing the UFO, but the UFO also having some kind of effect on its environment. Heinick writes, Close encounters of the second kind These are similar to the first kind, except that physical effects on both animate and inanimate material are noted. Vegetation is often reported as having been pressed down, burned, or scorched. Tree branches are reported broken. Animals are frightened, sometimes to the extent of physically injuring themselves in their fright. Inanimate objects, most often vehicles, are reported as becoming momentarily disabled, their engines killed, radios stopped, and headlights dimmed or extinguished. In such cases, the vehicles reportedly return to normal operation after the UFO has left the scene. Then there are close encounters of the third kind, which involve seeing beings of some sort in connection with the UFO. Heineck referred to these as the occupants of the UFO, and they could be seen either in the UFO, on the UFO, or outside the UFO. But seeing apparently intelligent beings in conjunction with the UFO was the distinguishing characteristic of a CE3, or Close Encounter of the Third Kind. Like in Steven Spielberg's 1977 movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where we build up to the climactic sequence in which a UFO lands and a bunch of occupants get out and are seen. 
Incidentally, J. Allen Hynek has a cameo appearance in that scene. He doesn't have any lines, but he's the gray-haired, goateed gentleman in a suit who walks up in the crowd smoking a pipe. Stephen Greer refers to what he's doing as producing close encounters of the fifth kind. Where does that terminology come from and what does it mean? After Heineck created the original three-part Close Encounter scale, others have tried to extend it. Thus far, there are no standard agreed-upon definitions for what a Close Encounter beyond the third kind would involve, and different authors use different terminology. A fairly common understanding of what a Close Encounter of the fourth kind would be would be when a human being goes on board a UFO, like Richard Dreyfuss at the end of Steven Spielberg's movie. He actually gets a Close Encounter of the fourth kind by many people's definition since he gets to go on board the UFO. Sometimes people report being invited on board UFOs and going on to them voluntarily, but they also report being taken on board UFOs against their wills. As a result, there's an ambiguity with the proposed close encounter of the fourth kind. This category could refer to voluntary boardings of UFOs, but it's also used to refer to alien abduction reports. What about Greer's CE5s, or Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind? This is something unique to him. He made up his own definition for this term, and it refers to human-initiated encounters with UFOs. In other words, in one way or another, human beings take the initiative to contact UFOs or the beings aboard them and arrange for a close encounter. And since we can't typically go to where the UFOs are... That means arranging for them to come here and visit us, such as through the protocol for summoning that he claimed to work out with the aliens in his 1973 encounter. But like I said, this terminology is unique to Greer. If you see someone referring to close encounters of the fifth kind or CE5s, they're very likely someone connected with Greer. You said Greer claims to have used his CE5 protocols in the 1970s in France to summon UFOs. Does he claim to have done so on other occasions? Yes. In fact, in 1990, he founded an organization called the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, known as C-SETI. This is not to be confused with the regular SETI Institute, whose name stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. SETI is a respectable organization that does things like use radio telescopes to search for signs of extraterrestrial life by listening for radio transmissions from them. By contract, by contrast, Greer's C-SETI is considered more of a fringe group that seeks to use telepathy to summon UFOs. How does SETI feel about Greer's organization calling itself C-SETI? I haven't seen a statement from them on the matter, but I can't imagine that they're particularly pleased. SETI has enough trouble getting funding, and they wouldn't welcome being confused with Greer's C-SETI. And they might consider him to be illegitimately trying to cash in on their more reputable name. In any event, Greer has used C-SETI to do lots of attempts to contact extraterrestrials. Until COVID, he would often hold in-person CE5 sessions in which a group of a dozen people or more would come and participate. They were paying around $3,000 per person, meaning that each event would gross around $72,000 if 12 people were there. Though you'd have to back out uh, the cost of the facility where they hold the event, so C said he wouldn't be netting that much per event. On the other hand, attendees, in addition to their fee, must pay for their own transportation, food, lodging, and so forth, so C said he would still be making a substantial amount of money per event. I did some checking, and it appears that CSETI became a nonprofit corporation in 1992, and it continued to be one until 2012. But at the end of 2012, it relinquished its nonprofit status and reorganized as a for profit corporation. Has Greer undertaken other efforts besides CSETI? In his book Extraterrestrials and the American Zeitgeist, author Aaron Gullius writes, Beginning in the early 1990s, he inaugurated the first of a series of nonprofit organizations. These organizations have varying foci and goals, but they share a number of characteristics. They all urge citizen involvement to affect change in social, cultural, and political arenas. They all find fault with aspects of the American status quo, attributing this negative state of affairs, state of affairs to government secrecy in the realms of extraterrestrial contact 
and advanced technology, allegedly sourced from extraterrestrial craft. Despite these faults, all of these organizations assert that improvement is possible and that humanity's future hangs in the balance, awaiting the efforts of everyday American citizens. Greer targets each of these organizations to specific audiences, using different language and appeals to different mindsets, ranging from those who might consider themselves open-minded and spiritual to those who might identify themselves as skeptical and materialistic. One of Greer's most famous efforts is what he calls the Disclosure Project. Stephen Greer is most often identified with his Disclosure Initiative, which began as Project Starlight in 1993 and still continues. According to its background briefing points for congressional hearings and legislation, the Disclosure Project has been, quote, identifying top secret military, government, and other witnesses to UFO and extraterrestrial events, end quote. The purpose of this identification is to establish, beyond any doubt, the existence of extraterrestrial life forms, visitation, and technology. So the idea is that the U.S. government knows all about the aliens, has some of their tech, and is harmfully keeping this from the American public. Greer seeks to gather insider whistleblowers to alert the public to these facts and force the government towards UFO disclosure, where they finally spill the beans about what they know. Famously, in 2001, Greer and a group of his associates made a presentation at the National Press Club in Washington where they called for disclosure. On May 9, 2001, 20 military, government, and corporate witnesses held a press conference in Washington, D.C. And these are folks who have been involved in so-called black budget or covert unacknowledged projects. They described a decades-long conspiracy to cover up extraterrestrial visitation to Earth. These unacknowledged special access projects are taking in at least 40 to 80 billion dollars per year. And the study of extraterrestrial technology in covert military programs. And they are sitting on technologies that can change the world forever. This technology would liberate Earth from fossil fuels, environmental devastation, and poverty in a single generation. The press conference event is still remembered in the UFO community, but it's not very well known outside of it. Aaron Gullius writes, The Disclosure Project rests on the perceived credibility of its witnesses and those giving testimony about their experiences with ET intelligence. Greer and supporters of the Disclosure Project aver that its witnesses are truthful because they are credible. Further, their credibility stems from their positions and occupations. In the executive summary of evidence the project released in 2001, witnesses are identified by pseudonyms, but their occupations are clearly stated. This indicates that what they do is more important than who they are in establishing their credibility and thus the truth of their claims. The witnesses presented are described as senior air traffic controller, former head of the British Ministry of Defense, and National Reconnaissance Office operative. In some cases, witnesses are identified only by the organizations for which they worked, U.S. Air Force, U.S. Strategic Command, or New York Air National Guard. Credibility, it seems, can be established through mere association with certain institutions. The Disclosure Project's May 9, 2001 briefing at the National Press Club was to be a showcase for the credibility of the project's witnesses. These witnesses range from retired military officers to government scientists to NASA employees. Some of this testimony was quite vague. Much of the testimony at the briefing event centered on similar stories, government intimidation of UFO witnesses and those who had experienced alleged contact with alien intelligences or craft. So the event did not make a long-lasting impression outside the UFO community. However, Greer has kept at it for over 30 years. Gullius observes, Greer's projects center around three important concepts. First, the revelation of a single significant thing, ET-inspired technology, which will reshape the world into a better place. Second, Greer has always emphasized the necessity of ordinary people's involvement in the cause. For example, citizens should be involved with coming forward with secret information or writing to one's representatives and demanding investigation and action to put this information into action. Third, in Greer's work, there is a villain, a power or organization fighting to maintain the status quo against a rising tide of progress. 
And we'll hear more about who Greer paints as the villain in his scenario. You know, in 2017, the New York Times published videos of UFOs and information from the Pentagon's ATIP program, which we've covered in episodes 41, 70, and 161. Has Greer been pleased by that? Isn't that the disclosure that, disclosure that he's been asking for? Despite what you might think, he's not happy about it. He sees the current disclosure efforts as part of an overall sinister conspiracy to poison society against the aliens. He's thus sought to portray the people responsible for the these revelations as villains, whereas he and his associates are the shining saviors who need to rescue us from the ongoing sinister government agenda. Why isn't he happy with the current government UFO revelations? Because they've been justified to the public on national security grounds. For decades, the government was dismissive of UFOs, and the government closed its public Air Force investigation into UFOs, Project Blue Book, back in 1969. But in the early 2000s, as we'll hear more about in future episodes, Congress quietly authorized the Defense Department to start a program to start looking into them again, because military personnel were encountering strange things in the sky that they couldn't explain. The These things the were US infringing the on the airspace of military operations, and whenever anything is infringing on your airspace, especially when a military operation is going on, it's a national security concern. It's especially concerning if it's getting right up in your military's face and doing things they can't duplicate. Whether the objects are earthly, like from a competitor nation state like Russia or China, or whether they're extraterrestrial, they're really a source of concern. And so the government authorized what became the ATIP program to look into them. But Greer views the justification of the program on national security grounds as part of a sinister plot to make the aliens look like our enemies and turn the public against them. The danger of this, of course, is that this is exactly what all the fascistic demagogues do to an innocent target, whether it be Jews in Germany or African Americans in this country. They will create sort of a, a boogeyman effect to try to get people mobilized against it. And as one member of a royal family told me, we need to do things so that the public will accept in blood and treasure the sacrifices needed to have an interplanetary war, I'm quoting. So Greer accuses the U.S. government of fascistic behavior, and he seems to intimate that we may treat aliens like the Nazis treated Jewish people, or that we may oppress the aliens the way African Americans were oppressed. And he quotes a member of a royal family as telling him that they're getting us ready for an interstellar war with the aliens. By the way, note that he ref he references a member of a royal family. One of the things Greer is famous for is name dropping important individuals, and we'll hear more about that. Greer has a negative view of the U.S. government and military and how they've handled the UFO situation. How bad does he think it's been? Bad enough that he says we've shot down and killed many ETs. Here, he reviews humanity's violence over the past 100 years. World wars, hundreds of millions of people killed in war, the advent of weapons of mass destruction, our going into space in a competitive way with the Soviet Union for the Apollo projects and others, the degradation and destruction of our environment, our targeting of extraterrestrial assets around the Earth and in space, and successfully killing many ETs and downing their spacecraft. If we've killed aliens who are coming to Earth, why doesn't Greer consider them a national security threat? If we started killing personnel from other countries who are visiting the U.S., we might well expect them to strike back at us. Because Greer thinks the ETs are utterly non-hostile. Knowing all that, if they were hostile in the way we think of an invading hostile force, that would have been made abundantly clear to us the day we detonated the first atomic bomb. The fact is they have shown remarkable restraint, almost a level of a Gandhian pacifism not to have pushed back. So the threat isn't extraterrestrial. The threat is covert human. These secret projects are an existential threat to Earth, the environment, and to our 
peace and space and relationship with these civilizations. I remember being at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base where a lot of the Roswell stuff ended up and it was the Foreign Technology Division of the Air Force. And I was there to do a briefing and the colonel said, well, what if these civilizations are a threat? He was trying to, to, to bring me into that view. And I said, sir, with all due respect, given the galactically stupid things you have been doing, if they were a threat, you would know it by now, and we would not be having this conversation and breathing the free air of Earth. It would have been point, set, match, over. So what does Greer view as the way out of this situation? He believes his own organization and his CE5 efforts to contact the aliens on friendly terms is what will save us. Here's how he describes the contact protocols working. The steps of this are that you sit in quiet consciousness, but just in quiet consciousness, connect to that aspect of your mind that is unbounded, and then intend to sense, feel, see, know where the ET craft is. It could be in another galaxy. Connect to those beings, politely invite them to come and visit you, and then you connect to their communication systems and their consciousness, which are integrated, and you show them where you are. So you kind of zoom in. It's almost like a, a vectoring, a zooming in from wherever they are to where you are. Let's say if you're in North Carolina, you're coming into Earth, you're coming into North America, the East Coast, the mountains, the Blue Ridge, zoom, down to a few square meters around where you are, where you clearly show them where you are. It's very easy to do once you practice it for a while. And Greer says that the intelligence community has taken notice of what he's doing. Even though what I'm doing with CE5 is what I'm most ridiculed for, it was the project that got the most respect and attention from the intelligence community because they knew it was real. They knew the science of consciousness is real. They knew that these ET civilizations utilize communication technologies that interface with thought and telepathy and consciousness. They all know this. This is an open secret in the intelligence community. They know that if people understood the power of consciousness and of mass consciousness, they would be able to completely change the direction of the planet. He says the intelligence community has tried to intimidate him and that they've tried to bribe him to stop, reportedly offering him a $2 billion payout if he'll just cease his efforts. But Greer is determined to change the planet. In his 2020 documentary, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, his narrator says that we all have a duty to be ambassadors for Earth and to thwart the intentions of the national security state. It remains the duty of we the people to become peaceful ambassadors to the universe. Much like a denial of service cyber attack can bottleneck and bring down a computer network, millions of people initiating contact would completely overwhelm the national security state's ability to subvert disclosure. And Greer doesn't think that we need all that many people to bring this about and to transform society. Just 1% of the population or less. When a critical mass of people, and whether it's 1% or a fraction of that, depends on the state of consciousness of those who are practicing the meditation or a prayer or coherence. But at that point, you can shift an entire civilization. If we all become coherent, just 1% of us, and we become aligned and coherent and move in the right direction, it will transform the other 99%, even though they don't know that we're doing it. And that, the intelligence community is very much afraid of, because that's something, A, they cannot control, and B, it would transcend their ability to alter the outcome. So don't worry, Stephen Greer and his 1% should be able to transform our society without us knowing it and save us from the sinister national security state so that we won't have to go to war with the aliens. Is there anything else that Stephen Greer is famous for in addition to the Disclosure Project in his CE5 encounters? We should probably mention what is known as the Atacama Skeleton. The Atacama Skeleton, sometimes referred to just as Ata, was found in a desert town in Chile in the Atacama Desert. The skeleton still has dried flesh attached to it, and it's about six inches long and has an elongated skull, so it looks very unusual. Greer has portrayed 
portrayed the skeleton, which he calls the Atacama humanoid, as a possible extraterrestrial. And we'll be talking more about whether the Atacama skeleton may be extraterrestrial in origin. Before we get to our theories and faith and reason perspective, we do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Daniel C., Barrett H., Philip D., James C., and Kyle M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. And by Fearvento Law, PLLC, specializing in adult guardianships and conservatorships, probate and estate planning matters, accepting clients throughout Michigan, taking into account your individual health care, financial, and religious needs. Visit FearventoLaw.com, F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O-Law.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about Stephen Greer and his claims? Over the last 30 years, Greer has made a complex set of claims that aren't easy to summarize and evaluate. Here, we'll be looking at a few basic issues. First, although it's a fairly minor one, we'll look at the Atacama skeleton and whether it's extraterrestrial. Second, we'll look a bit at Greer himself. And third, we'll look at how his CE5 sessions work and whether they really summon UFOs. That will give us some insight into how reliable his claims are in general and whether his overall overall narrative of a sinister national security state plot to poison the public against peaceful aliens should be taken seriously. So what can we say about Greer and his claims from the faith perspective? First, Greer could well be right that alien life and even intelligent alien life exists, and the Christian faith would have no problem with that. Listeners can go back and review episode 55 on the theological implications of intelligent alien life for more on that subject. Second, the U.S. government does sometimes do sinister, immoral things, as we've covered in many previous episodes. So if Greer turns out to be right that the government is trying to poison the public against peaceful aliens out of a desire to pursue a fascistic agenda, that would be bad from the faith perspective. It would be similarly bad if the government were suppressing technologies that could genuinely improve the human condition, though there would be a question of how and when to roll out these technologies in a way that didn't do a lot of short-term, short-term damage to human society. What about his encouraging his followers to serve as unauthorized ambassadors with aliens? We should note that they do use that term, ambassadors. Uh, They refer to this as their ambassadors to the universe program. And as we heard in the audio, they're trying to subvert the efforts of the government to protect us from UFOs, which they view as misguided efforts. If he's right that aliens exist, but he's wrong about their being entirely peaceful, then what he's doing would be extremely dangerous. There are reasons ordinary citizens aren't allowed to negotiate with foreign powers. Unauthorized negotiations both subvert the democratic process and can lead to extremely dangerous situations, even wars. So conducting unauthorized negotiations on behalf of humanity would be very problematic morally. Of course, that assumes he really is in contact with aliens, which is something we need to look at from the reason perspective. Okay, so then what can we say about Stephen Greer from the reason perspective? Let's start. What about his claim that the Atacama skeleton may be extraterrestrial in origin? The evidence doesn't point that way. There have been anthropological and DNA studies of the skeleton, and they do not point to it being an alien. Instead, the studies that have been done point to it being a premature baby with birth defects and possible genetic abnormalities. Greer disputes these studies, but his claims regarding the skeleton are not widely supported even within the UFO community. Okay, so then let's move on. What do you make of Greer himself? The key thing for me will be whether his claims to be able to summon aliens using his CE5 protocols are true, but it's worth looking at the man himself and the work he produces, such as his documentaries, as a way of gauging his overall sensibilities. 
You mentioned that he name drops a lot. He also frequently talks about giving briefings to highly placed individuals. What do you make of that? It's true that he name drops a lot, or at least the next closest thing to it. I mean, sometimes he explicitly names prominent individuals, but other times he alludes to people who are highly placed without naming them, like when we heard him mention a member of a royal family. For example, when he names someone, here's how he talks about knowing the astronaut Edgar Mitchell. One of the people that I met in, in the course of doing this work was astronaut Edgar Mitchell, who was the sixth man to walk on the moon. I also brought him to the briefing I did in 1997 with the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Tom Wilson. The data on that has since leaked out. Edgar Mitchell realized there was this connection between space and these extraterrestrial life forms and the science of consciousness that was very integral to the study. Most of the people that I I have met with in senior science, NASA, aerospace, and intelligence community figures know that the key missing ingredient out of most people's understanding of the whole UFO phenomenon is the science of consciousness. And Edgar Mitchell realized that quite early on because of his own personal experience out in space as uh, the sixth man to walk on the moon. So Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon briefing the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Tom Wilson, senior science, NASA, aerospace, and intelligence community figures, members of royal families, name drop much? Uh, I'd also note that back in the 1990s, Edgar Mitchell asked Greer to stop associating him with his work. In a 2001 interview, Mitchell stated... I cooperated with Stephen Greer some years ago, but he began to overreach his data continuously, necessitating a withdrawal by myself and, I believe, several others. I have requested to be removed from any website, announcements, etc., but see that has not taken place. Although I firmly believe it is time for openness and disclosure by government, I object to being misused in this fashion and acquire guilt by association with certain claims that simply are not true. So Mitchell made the request that Greer stop using his name back in 2001, actually earlier than that. But Greer is still doing it 19 years later in the 2020 documentary we heard the clip from. What about the briefings he claims to have given to highly placed individuals? These claims appear to be misrepresentations of the situations in question. To say that he went somewhere and delivered a briefing suggests that he was responding to an official order or request, that the people he briefed valued what he had to say and requested that he come and tell them about it. I don't know how many of these briefings actually occurred, but there is evidence that they were not what Greer makes them sound like. For example, he has claimed that he gave a briefing in 1993 to then-CIA director James Woolsey, among others. However, in 1999, Woolsey and the others present at the briefing sent Greer a letter in which they said, It has just come to the attention of the four of us that you have, without giving any of us the opportunity to comment, published a distorted account of a dinner party of some six years ago at which the four of us, you and your wife, were seated together. In the introduction to your book, Extraterrestrial Contact, published earlier this year, you portray this dinner party conversation during which the four of us listen to your views and politely ask questions as a briefing with a cover story. You further assert assert that Mr. and Mrs. Woolsey reported a UFO sighting to you and agreed with your view. You include specific alleged quotations from them. None of this is accurate. You have portrayed politeness as acquiescence and questions as affirmations. Your conduct in this matter contravenes both accuracy and simple manners. The letter is then signed by Director Woolsey, John L. Peterson, and both of their wives, who were seated with Greer and his wife at the dinner party. So, ouch. (laughs) Apart from using people's names without their permission and reports of misrepresenting dinner party conversations as briefings, what do you make of Greer? He's a really strange bird. In the first place, he has what strikes me as a kind of messiah complex. He's the one, with his followers, who's going to save the world from totalitarianism and interstellar war, using protocols that 
he and the aliens worked out back in 1973. He expects to lead a global transformation in which he gets 1% or less of the population to start meditating and fundamentally transform society without us realizing what's going on. That's really ambitious, to put it mildly. He also portrays himself as bravely standing up to stern intimidation efforts by the military officials who then turn out to be secretly jealous of him. The head of army intelligence and a few of his minions intercepted me and took me to a hotel room, very threatening. They were saying, what the hell do you think you're doing? Teaching people to bypass our systems and contact these civilizations. I said, I don't recognize your authority. And then I looked them in the eyes and I said, I'm not afraid of you. I don't care about your money. And the general just sat back like this and went, well, we know exactly who this son of a bitch is. It, it was very frustrating for them. But later, a member of the, one of the European royal families, who I don't want to name, who was involved with that crowd, came up to me and, and she said, you know, they're very jealous of what you and your team are doing. They know that you guys actually collectively have all the power and they wish they could do what you're doing but they're in the box of this national security state program that they cannot escape from and you're free and they're really jealous of what you guys are doing so yeah everything is kind of all about him that kind of self-centeredness is sometimes characteristic of narcissistic personalities do you think Greer's a narcissist? I'm not a psychologist, and I haven't treated him, so I can't clinically diagnose him with narcissistic personality disorder. He may or may not have that. But he certainly struck people, even among his own followers, as having narcissistic tendencies. For example, here's an online statement by a person who says that they were an enthusiastic follower of Greer, only to be disillusioned after attending one of his events. I followed Dr. Greer's activities with enthusiasm since 2001 when he established the Disclosure Project. I read his books, watched his interviews, and listened to his meditation CDs. I liked everything the man seemed to be about and shared his views on the need to inform the public about the presence of extraterrestrial visitors on Earth. I still share these goals. So it was with great excitement that I signed up for a CSETI presentation and a one-day workshop with Dr. Greer that took place on November 13th and 14th, 2009, in Costa Mesa, California. Surprisingly, my preconceived opinion about Dr. Greer's character began to disintegrate as I listened to his presentation. It was disheartening to discover he is excessively fascinated with himself, prone to indulge in name-dropping and in bragging about his fantastic high-end and or in-the-know contacts and connections, not to mention the multitude of outlandish remarks he makes with a straight face, such as his impact on the rogue, majestic secret government. So much so that, according to him, he, quote, rejected a $2 billion payout to shut up and abandon the ET disclosure issue, end quote. Needless to say, that night I left the auditorium less enthusiastic about what Dr. Greer is all about. And this person's view of Dr. Greer only went down from there. It was not until the workshop and the outing next day that my opinion about him really changed, unfortunately for the worst. Again, during the workshop, Dr. Greer devoted some time to self-admiration while attempting to appear humble by saying, I'm just a country doctor from North Carolina. By then, I was becoming quite uncomfortable about him, but as the workshop progressed, my discomfort turned into dismay as I watched how rudely he treated some attendees who asked valid questions or made harmless remarks, but whose timing or subject he deemed inappropriate. I was truly shocked and could not believe my ears and eyes as I watched him lash at them with such scornful contempt. In the past, whenever I would read negative reviews about Dr. Greer, especially ones describing him as a self-centered narcissist, I would reject them and conclude they were made by people who couldn't handle the truth. But based on what I saw and experienced firsthand, it appears Dr. Greer is in love with himself, and because he sees himself above others, he dislikes most people. However, he desperately craves attention, so he created this ET disclosure platform to attract as large an audience as possible in order to obtain the recognition and adulation he sorely needs. That's from a person who shares Greer's views about ETs visiting Earth and the need to inform the public. And here's another statement, this one from a person who believes that Greer and the group they were with was able to summon an actual UFO. 
I went on a week-long expedition with Dr. Greer and 30 other people in Joshua Tree National Park in 2015. People seem to want to know what the deal with Greer is, and I consider myself to be a pretty good judge of character, so I'll tell you my impression. Firstly, Greer is a narcissist. In some ways, the expedition and so much about what Greer does is about putting himself in the spotlight. People wonder why he does it, since he was a successful ER doctor, but I think he gets more thrill from having 30 people adoringly hanging on every word he says than he did from the operating room. And when I say hang on every word, that guy sure can talk endlessly. On and on and on about conspiracy theories and past events and why things are the way they are, I would say the fact that Greer is a narcissist is the main reason he is who he is and is doing what he does. So bear in mind that this is from a person who says he's convinced he saw a UFO at a Greer event and he still regards Greer as a narcissist. Of course, just because a person is self-centered and narcissistic doesn't mean that they're wrong. There have been a lot of people with forceful, narcissistic personalities who've made discoveries and inventions that went on to change the world. So whatever he's like personally, that doesn't mean he wasn't able to work out summoning protocols with extraterrestrials or that he can't produce human-initiated UFO encounters. True. So we need to look at the quality of the evidence he brings forward, such as in his documentaries. In this episode, we've principally been hearing from his 2020 documentary, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, contact has begun. And I can say that I'm not very impressed with it from an evidential perspective. For a start, Greer has footage from Richard Doty, the former Air Force counterintelligence officer that we heard about in episodes 143 and 144 on Paul Benowitz and Project Beta. In the documentary, Doty is portrayed as one of the good guys, as a UFO whistleblower who's letting us the public know what the government is really up to with ufos but as i concluded at the end of episode 144 you should never trust anything richard doty says and you shouldn't because richard doty is a lying liar who tells lies so the fact richard doty is showing up here in the documentary isn't a good sign no, but Greer could have been hoodwinked by Doty, just like other people have. It would still be very significant if there were video evidence of Greer summoning UFOs, like high-quality footage of Greer's CE5 events. Yes, but when you watch the documentary, they mix in a lot of historical UFO footage, along with other modern UFO footage that wasn't taken by Greer and his associates. Some of the footage is interesting, but it wasn't taken by Greer's people, so it has nothing to do with his CE5 events. It just pads out the running time. So do other tangents they go on, such as talking about parapsychology experiments involving water crystals and plants and remote viewing. All of those things have little to do with his CE5 protocols. We also spend a lot of time hearing about his overall sinister national security state narrative and how he and his colleagues are out to save the world, during which Greer regularly uses New Age buzzwords like consciousness. The overall impression I get from the documentary is that it's a padded two-hour commercial for his CE5 events, but there's comparatively little evidence presented regarding these events themselves. What kind of evidence do they present for the CE5 events? A lot of it is just still photos from the events. One of the things that struck me about them is that a lot of them are awfully fuzzy, much fuzzier than the Defense Department UFO videos that have been released. A lot are just fuzzy lights in the distance or fuzzy indiscernible shapes that Greer claims are aliens that you either can't see or that look doctored. We'll have a link to a YouTube video where a guy who wants to believe Greer reviews the supposed pictures of aliens and finds them unconvincing. When we do get a clear, up-close image, it looks doctored. Specifically, there are images that look like they've been doctored using a photographic technique known as light painting. In light painting, you use a long exposure and a moving source of light to create a long streak of light. And these images in the documentary look like either classic light painting techniques were used or that someone achieved the same effect in Photoshop. For example, there's one image of people at a CE5 event in Japan where it looks like someone went into Photoshop and hand drew streaks of light with little arrowheads drawn on them coming out of people's foreheads. It's really amateurish. 
What about what eyewitnesses who have attended CE5 events said? Are they convinced that they've been able to summon UFOs? Some of them are convinced, but others not so much. For example, here's part of what the attendee who was present at the 2009 Costa Mesa workshop had to say. The worst and most disheartening part of this experience was witnessing the CSETI's field contact protocol. At the site, a number of devices, such as a radio transmitter, magnetometer, radar detectors, infrared scope, etc., were arranged. Even though I don't doubt Dr. Greer may have had several ET experiences in the past, what I observed in the field that night is inconsistent with his hyperbolic claims, suggesting he can vector ETs and make them appear. His actions and the facts demonstrated that at the very least, this is a bold exaggeration. Not surprisingly, to cover up for this assertion, Dr. Greer made sure to bring out a series of possibilities for a no-show prior to the field excursion. According to him, sometimes the ETs might not appear because, quote, there is someone in the group without good intent and a clean heart, or, quote, the ETs feel threatened by U.S. military, or, quote, even though they won't fully materialize, they will manifest in a thousand other ways, end quote. Conveniently, there were plenty of people at hand, mostly staff, who would come forward to state that, while meditating, they saw this or heard that. Most amusing, though, were Dr. Greer's remarks at the beeps and sounds made by his electronic equipment. You see, according to him, an ET he named Walter communicates via one of these electronic devices, and Dr. Greer is able to recognize which beeps he makes. Additionally, the large quantity of wow and oh my god remarks coming out of Dr. Greer's mouth over unseen or imaginary non-events was sadly hilarious. Oftentimes, he would point his mega laser beam pointer at some spot in the sky and claim he was seeing a partly materialized ET craft. Of course, anyone else saw nothing, even though, according to him, many significant events were taking place that night because, quote, we were such a great group, end quote. To make matters worse, Dr. Greer supplemented the lack of any occurrence with information he received via remote viewing. I found this charade insulting to my intelligence, intuitiveness, and psychic sensibilities. I know ETs were not present that night, and I would have respected Dr. Greer if he had been forthright and acknowledged the fact that there was no activity. I would understand. It happens. So this person was not at all impressed and believed Greer was stretching the truth and claiming to have extraterrestrial things happening when really there were none. I'm also pretty sure that at least some folks in the remote viewing community would not be happy with Greer trying to associate their discipline with his claims. Is there any motion video evidence of something odd happening at one of Greer's CE5 events? There is. If you go to his webpage, there is a subpage of photographic and video evidence. Much of the stuff on this page is from people who are not associated with Greer, like a historic 1965 UFO photo from California. Others are still photos taken at Greer's events, some of which clearly involve light painting. But there is one, and only only one video taken at one of his events. It occurred on January 27th, 2015 in Vero Beach, Florida. We're going to listen to an abbreviated version of this encounter. The whole encounter is several minutes long, but I've cut it down so that it's just the essential parts. After we listen to it, we're going to walk through it a piece at a time and note the significance of the different pieces of what he's saying. First, here's the overall clip so that you can get the general shape of the event. In this clip, Greer has been giving a lecture to his attendees on a beach, and then a bright orange light appears in the distance off the shore over the ocean. It appears underneath a cloud bank. Then, after a bit, a second light appears to the north of the first light, so the southern light appears first, then the northern light. Both lights gently float downward towards the ocean. The first southern light goes out, and finally the second northern light goes out. Here's the clip. What is that orange, orange, orange object? Look up. Oh, whoa. Oh, my God. Whoa, whoa just don't, don't, don't pop stand too up, much. Please crouch down and look because you'll block our cameras. Okay, that, you see that color? No, that's, that's so a ship. So let's thank them for coming. Wow, and it's above the sea level. Please turn off your night scope, Charles. 
off. Oh, here they come. There are two. Whoever's right in the front, if you can kind of just... Look at this, how gorgeous. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I'm looking with the night scopes. There's no smoke, there's no trails. These are not flares. Oh my okay, goodness. Okay, let's welcome them here. Oh, they're, they're so beautiful. They, they're waiting for us to arrive. So connect to them in your consciousness and invite them here. These are the golden ones I talked about. See how gold? Yeah. Are because the horizon is only seven to ten miles, depending on the conditions. So it's probably a couple miles. Let's welcome their uh, beings on board to join us in meditation. That is such a beautiful color. So you'll never forget that color. Yeah, this is a major event. So we are grateful. So open your heart chakra and send them the beauty of humanity. And if you uh, can see what I'm doing, you connect with your palms out like this and your third eye and your heart making like a tetrahedron radiating our pureness and love towards them. They emerge from the sky, but they're very, very close to the ocean. They're just hovering. We should be filming. I am filming. But just trying to avoid. Those in front, if you can get on your knees or sit on the ground and look in front of your chairs, but stay low. Thank you. I'm just going to reposition. You need a higher tripod. No, I, I can bring it high. I just don't want to... Well, don't wait. We're going to lose it. Just, yeah. Stay. Yeah, just yeah, keep yeah. with it. It's not a time for that. Okay, that's clear air. It just sort of vanished, the one on the right. They've stayed pretty much the same altitude. Let's invite them to come as close as they can. Oh, that's gone into the ocean. See what it did? Okay, there is still an object there. Very faint, I can see with the night scope. Now, the way that you know that that's uh, not like something like a flare, first of all, there's no, it didn't shoot up and then come down and didn't drop them. And that's the end of the audio. Now, let's go back through it and note the significant bits. What is that orange, orange, orange object? Look up. Oh, whoa. Oh, my God. So Greer has broken off his lecture to note the appearance of an orange ball of light over the ocean, and people start ooing and awing over it. Whoa, whoa, just don't, don't, don't pop too up, much. Please crouch down and look, because you'll block our cameras. Greer then asks people not to block their cameras, and it's natural that they would have cameras there if his contact protocols work, and they were expecting this to happen. And providing proof of the experience would be important, so it's natural they wouldn't want the attendees blocking the cameras. Okay, that, you see that color? No, that's, that's so a let's ship. So thank them for coming. Wow. He wants the attendees to telepathically thank the UFO occupants for responding to their contact request, so that's not unexpected. And it's above the sea oh, level. Please turn off your night scope, Charles. Off. This is quite interesting. Greer sees an attendee named Charles using a night scope and interrupts his assistant to tell Charles to turn the night scope off. He then says it again rather firmly. Off. Let's listen to that again because it'll be important. And it's above the sea oh, level. Please turn off your night scope, Charles. Off. So Greer really wants Charles to turn his night scope off. Oh, here they come. There are two. Whoever's right in the front, if you can kind of just look at this, how gorgeous. Oh, my goodness. A second orange light has appeared to the north of the first one, so people start appreciating that one. Now, both the original southern light and the new northern light are in the sky a few degrees above the horizon. Okay, so I'm looking with the night scopes. There's no smoke. There's no trails. These are not flares. Whoa! Greer reveals that he is looking through a night scope. That raises an important question. If it's okay for Greer to watch the event through a night scope, why isn't it okay for Charles to watch it through a night scope? Why did Greer insist that Charles turn off his night scope when Greer was using one himself? Notice that Greer assures them based on what he's seeing through his night scope, that there is no smoke, there's no trails, these are not flares. Greer assures the attendees that this is what he's seeing through his night scope, but since Charles has been ordered to turn his night scope off, Charles cannot confirm what Greer is seeing. Let's hear that one again. Okay, so I'm looking with the night scopes, there's no smoke, there's no trails, these are not flares. And now the next bit. Oh my okay, goodness. Okay, let's welcome them here. Oh, they're, they're so beautiful. They, they're waiting for us to arrive. 
So connect to them in your consciousness and invite them here. These are the golden ones I talked about. See how gold? Yeah. So he says connect to them, so more attempt to establish telepathic rapport with the UFO occupants. Because the horizon is only 7 to 10 miles, depending on the conditions, so it's probably a couple miles. Greer speculates that the lights are a couple miles offshore. Let's welcome their uh, beings on board to join us in meditation. That is such a beautiful color, so you'll never forget that color. More telepathic welcoming for the occupants, and Greer seems to be unusually impressed with the color of the lights, telling the attendees that the color is something they will never forget, and thus building up the significance of the event in the attendees' minds. Yeah, this is a major event. Greer says that this is a major event, which would mean that he does not normally get something as impressive as this when he does a CE5 contact event. This event is unusual. It's more dramatic than what normally happens, so Greer will be extra concerned about what happens during it, as we'll hear in a bit when he gives some more instructions to his cameraman. So we are grateful. So open your heart chakra and send them the beauty of humanity. And if you uh, can see what I'm doing, you connect with your palms out like this and your third eye and your heart making like a tetrahedron radiating our pureness and love towards them. More instructions about how to achieve telepathic rapport with the aliens, this time with some more specific instructions from Greer. They emerge from the sky, but they're very, very close to the ocean. They're just hovering. Greer notes correctly that the lights appeared in the sky close to the ocean. He states that the two lights are hovering, but if you watch the actual video, which we'll have a link to, you can see that the lights have actually slowly descended in the sky. They have lowered from where they first appeared and are now closer to the ocean, like objects slowly floating downward. We should be filming. I am filming. But just trying to avoid. Those in front, if you can get on your knees or sit on the ground and look in front of your chairs, but stay low. Thank you. Greer tells his assistant we should be filming, and the assistant says that he is, and Greer reminds the people not to block the view of the cameras. We should be filming would be a natural reaction upon unexpectedly encountering UFOs. People who unexpectedly encounter UFOs would naturally want to film them. But Greer claims to have protocols that will let him bring UFOs in regularly, so it would be much more of a normal event for him. If he had this happen every day, he shouldn't be as concerned about filming what happens on each occasion. But Greer has said that this is a major event, so it's more dramatic than what he normally gets, and that would explain why he wants to make sure they're getting this encounter on film. I'm just going to reposition. You need a higher tripod. No, I can bring it high. I just don't want to... Well, don't wait. We're going to lose it. Just yeah. Yeah, yeah, keep yeah. with it. There's not a time for that. This is extremely significant. Greer and his assistant discuss optical filming procedures, and the assistant suggests repositioning his tripod and raising the camera level. During the crosstalk, I listen to this carefully at high volume, and what Greer says is, don't wait, we're going to lose it in a second, just keep with it, not enough time for that. That indicates that Greer has a very clear expectation of how long this experience is going to last, only a few more seconds, so the cameraman won't have time to reposition. If this were an ordinary CE5 UFO experience, then Greer might well have an understanding of how long it would last. But not if, as he says, this is a major event, in which case he wouldn't know how major it might be or how long it might last. So the fact that Greer shows awareness of how long, down to a range of seconds, the event should last is quite significant. Okay, that's clear air. It just sort of vanished, the one on the right. The first or southern light has now vanished, and Greer says that it leaves behind only clear air. They've stayed pretty much the same altitude. Let's invite them to come as close as they can. Oh, that's gone into the ocean. See what it did? Greer says that the two lights stayed pretty much at the same altitude, which they did seemingly 
gently floating down from where they first appeared until the first southern light vanished. Greer then starts to invite more telepathic rapport, but then changes course when the second northern light also vanishes. He says that it's gone into the ocean, and it is close to the ocean. However, if you watch the video carefully, the light is still clearly above the ocean when it goes out. It does not go into the ocean, but simply goes out like the first light did, which was also above the ocean when it winked out. Okay, there is still an object there, very faint, I can see with the night scope. Greer states that he can see through the night scope that he is using uh, that there is still an object there. It's not clear whether he's referring to the southern object, which had winked out first, still being above the horizon, or whether he's referring to the northern object, which winked out second, still being there, either above or below the level of the ocean. Unfortunately, since he's forbidden anyone else to use a night scope, nobody can clarify what he means. And notice that Greer has confirmed that he is still using a night scope, even though he has told others to turn theirs off. Now we come to the last part of the audio Greer made available. Now the way that you know that that's uh, not like something like a flare, first of all, there's no, it didn't shoot up and then come down and didn't drop them. Greer's parting thought in this audio is to tell the attendees that they didn't see flares in this encounter. The way he says they know this is they didn't see flares shoot up from the surface and then start dropping back down. This leaves, though, the possibility that they could be flares dropped from above and that then floated down towards the ocean until they burned out. So Greer's explanation doesn't cover the possibility that they were dropped by an airplane in the distance. Now, let's cut out all the stuff about how beautiful the lights are and about attempts to establish telepathic rapport with the occupants and listen to what remains. And what should we be listening for? Things to listen for include Greer firmly telling Charles to turn off his night scope, Greer admitting that he himself is using a night scope, Greer assuring people that what they are seeing are not flares based on what he's seeing through his night scope, Greer stating that this is a major event, so it's unusual and they need to be filming it, Greer stating that the lights are hovering when in fact they're slowly floating down towards the ocean, Greer's concern to make sure that they should be filming despite the fact he claims to be able to contact aliens regularly, Greer indicating to the cameraman that he knows within the range of a few seconds how much longer the event will last, despite the fact it's a major event and thus unusual, Greer stating inaccurately that the second light has entered the ocean when it actually winks out while above the ocean, Greer stating that he sees an object through the night scope that he's using, though he's forbidden others to use them. And finally, Greer assuring the attendees that what they have just seen are not flares since they didn't see them fired from below. So here we go. And it's above the sea oh, level. Please turn off your night scope, Charles. Off. Okay, so I'm looking with the night scopes. There's no smoke. There's no trails. These are not flares. Yeah, this is a major event. They're just hovering. We should be filming. I am filming. But just trying to avoid. Those in front, if you can get on your knees or sit on the ground and look in front of your chairs, but stay low. Thank you. I'm just going to reposition. You need a higher tripod. No, I can bring it high. I just don't want to. Well, don't wait. We're going to lose it. Just yeah. Stay. Yeah, 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 keep yeah. with it. There's no time for that. They've stayed pretty much the same altitude. Oh, that's gone into the ocean. See what it did? Okay, there is still an object there. Very faint, I can see with the night scope. Now, the way that you know that that's uh, not like something like a flare, first of all, there's no, it didn't shoot up and then come down and didn't drop them. So Greer is concerned that other people not use night scopes, even though he's using one. On the basis of what he sees through his night scope, he assures them that these are not flares. He says this is a major event they need to be filming. Despite the unusual nature of the event, he knows to within a few seconds how long it will last. And he concludes by again assuring the attendees that what they are seeing are not flares. And what does all that sound like to you? It sounds like they were flares. It sounds like this was a staged event, an event that was designed to be unusual and impressive. And Greer really wanted to get good footage of it to use as visual proof for people who might attend his events in the future. 
And he had previously established how long such an event would last so he'd know what to expect. And he didn't want others using night scopes because it could reveal the nature of the flares. So he limited the use of night scopes to only himself. And then he assured others twice that what they were seeing were not flares. The first time referring to what only he could see through his night scope, and the second time using an argument that only referred to flares being fired upward and that did not cover the possibility of them being dropped from above. It sounds like this was a fake staged event. Besides what we hear in the video, do we have other evidence that supports the idea that this was a faked event involving flares? We do. In a July 2020 opinion piece in the Washington Examiner titled, Did Stephen Greer Fake a UFO with Flares? National security writer Tom Rogan writes, Video of the sighting was posted to Greer's YouTube channel, and the incident was the first case listed on the, quote, photographic and video evidence page of Greer's website. And that's still true. It's still the first thing listed on the photo and video evidence page. So it's presumably what Greer considers the best evidence he can offer. The video introduction says the event occurred between 9.10 and 9.15 p.m. and, quote, was a result of an invitation initiated by the members using coherent thought and meditation practices, also known as CE5 protocols, end quote. The video description states, there were no boats or ships seen anywhere in the area of the objects, and there were no jets or planes or other airborne objects anywhere near the objects before, during, or after the event, end quote. That's not true, but let's not jump the gun. The video starts with one bright orange light appearing off the coast. Greer is heard directing a participant to, please turn off your night scope. Note that a night scope would assist in detecting low visibility aircraft in the vicinity. Shortly thereafter, a second light appears off the coast, to the left of the first light. Greer confirms that these are indeed UFOs. Quote, I'm looking with the night scopes. There's no smoke. There's no trails. These are not flares, he continues. They were waiting for us to arrive, end quote. At the 3 minute 32 second mark, the first light disappears. Ignoring the light's slow but obvious altitude decline, Greer states that they've stayed pretty much the same altitude, though. Let's invite them to come as close as they can. At the 4 minute 11 second mark, the second light dissipates. While the second light is quite obviously above the water as it fades out, Greer quickly states, Oh, that's gone into the ocean. See what it did? Greer concludes, Now, the way that you know that's not like something like a flare, first of all, it didn't shoot up and then come down. But were these UFOs, or were they something more terrestrial? Well, flight-aware flight tracking data attained by the Washington Examiner suggests the latter is true. At 9.11 p.m. on January 27, 2015, a Beach 76 Duchess registered N110SU was recorded flying at 85 miles per hour off Vero Beach. This is slower than the aircraft's normal cruising speed and would feasibly allow the air crew to deploy parachute flares or some other illumination device. The aircraft took off and returned to the airport in Fort Pierce. So flight tracking data indicated that despite what it says in the video description on YouTube, there was an airplane flying off Vero Beach at 9.11 p.m. when the video was taken. The airplane had taken off from Fort Pierce, Florida, which is about 30 miles south of Vero Beach. It flew north to Vero Beach, was present during the sighting of the lights, and then it turned around and came back. It was flying at 85 miles per hour, slower than its normal cruising speed, which would have allowed it to drop parachute flares that would float slowly towards the ocean. The owner of the aircraft is listed by the Federal Aviation Administration as Ari Ben Aviator Incorporated. The web website of the Fort Pierce-based flight school, Aviator College of Aeronautical Science and Technology, lists Michael Cohen as its president and CEO and, quote, the owner and only president of Ari Ben Aviator Inc. since its inception. When I reached out to the Aviator College to ask about the January 7, 2015 flight, Director of Maintenance Christopher Spear told me that the college never does things like dropping flares. After sending Spear a copy of the flight record, he did not respond to any further emails. So when contacted, an aviation school employee says that they never drop flares, 
but then he stopped responding when presented with a copy of the flight record in question. Tom Rogan concludes, The top line, however, is that the flight was in the place and time that the witnesses saw the lights. I'd thus offer a pretty confident assessment that what was seen off Vero Beach that night were not UFOs, but in fact flares of some kind. And I agree with that assessment, both because of what we hear Greer say in the video of the event that he made available, and also because of what we actually see in the video. What things in the video support the flare hypothesis? Six pieces of evidence. The first piece of evidence, as we just mentioned, Fort Pierce is south of Vero Beach, and a plane flying northward from Fort Pierce would explain why the lights appear in the order they do. At one moment, the plane would drop the first flare, and then a few moments later, when it was further north, it would drop the second flare. From the perspective of a person watching on the beach, the first flare would appear on the right or to the south, and then the second flare would appear on the left or to the north. And that's exactly what we see in the video. The flares appear the way they would if they were being dropped from a north flying plane. And what's the second piece of evidence? Since the plane's altitude would not change appreciably in those few moments, the flares should appear at the same altitude above the ocean. And that's what we see in the video. The lights appear at the same level in the sky. That's not something you could count on UFOs doing, but it is something you could count on flares being quickly dropped from the same plane doing. And what's the third piece of evidence? You also couldn't count on UFOs, which are famed for their unpredictable behavior, to gradually sink at approximately the same rate in the sky. I mean, they are famed for, like, zooming off unexpectedly. But you could count on flares tied to parachutes dropping slowly at the same rate through the sky. And that's exactly what we see in the video. The flares gradually sink towards the ocean at approximately the same rate. So what's the fourth piece of evidence? Since one flare would have been dropped before the other, you would expect the southern flare to sink lower in the sky first because it's been dropping for longer. Though depending on what happens with the parachutes and the wind currents, the altitudes might level off. And that's what we see in the video. The first southern light initially sinks faster and lower in the sky before the second northern light catches up to it. And what's the fifth piece of evidence? Since the flares would presumably be of the same type, they would burn for approximately the same amount of time. So you would expect the first southern flare to burn out first, and then the second northern flare to go out. And that's what we see in the video. The southern light goes out first, and then the northern light. And then what's the sixth and final piece of evidence? If the flares were the same type and burned for the same amount of time, we could calculate when the second should go out. So if we measure the time that the lights appeared, that should let us determine when the flares would burn out. In the video, the first light appears at about 45 seconds before the second one does. They're about 45 seconds apart. The first light remains in the sky for three minutes, suggesting it's a three-minute flare. We would then expect the second light to disappear around 45 or so seconds later. And that's what happens. The second light goes out about 40 seconds after the first, consistent with when it originally appeared. So both lights appear in the sky 45 seconds apart and then remain for three minutes before disappearing while still above the ocean, consistent with the idea that they were three-minute flares dropped 45 seconds apart. And that would explain why Greer was able to say... Well, don't wait. We're going to lose it. Just yeah, 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 keep yeah. with it. It's not a time for that. He knew that they were about to lose their photo opportunity because he knew these were three-minute flares. So when he saw the first flare go out, he knew they only had about 45 seconds before the second flare would go out as well. Thus, in addition to the audio evidence we heard 
and the flight tracking data uncovered by the Washington Examiner, there are six pieces of evidence in the video that are more consistent with the known behavior of flares dropped 45 seconds apart from a plane known to have been flying north off Vero Beach before turning around and going back to Fort Pierce. At least, these pieces of evidence are more consistent with the behavior of such flares than they would be with the famously unpredictable behavior of UFOs. Also, if this was a major event that was not typical of what happens at Greer's CE-5 encounters, he would have had to pay the plane to drop the flares. So he would have spent notable money on getting the event to happen, and that could contribute to his desire to get it on film, and why it's the only video he's made on his photographic and video evidence page. In light of all this, what do you make of Stephen Greer? Like Richard Doty, I think Greer is a lying liar who tells lies. Also, he couldn't pull off a stunt like this without help, so that means he's enlisting Confederates. This means that not only can we not trust what he says, we also can't trust what the people around him say because they may be among the Confederates. I think it's likely that a lot of his attendees are innocent. They're just dupes. But the people closely associated with him should not be trusted when it comes to reliable narratives about UFO matters. Does Greer's hoaxing this event mean that CE5s are impossible? No, it's not impossible that human beings might sometimes be able to contact aliens and convince them to show up. In fact, we'll look at some similar claims in future episodes, and we'll examine the evidence for them independently without tying them to Stephen Greer. But it obviously isn't easy to contact UFOs and get them to show up, because if it were, it would be happening all the time, because lots of people would love to see a UFO come on command. However, in this case, the evidence strongly suggests that Stephen Greer is a hoaxer, and we should not trust his claims, either about being able to vector in UFOs or about his overall narrative about saving the world and battling a sinister national security state. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on Dr. Stephen Greer? Aliens may be real, including intelligent alien life. It's possible that aliens may have visited Earth. It's even possible that Aliens could be in communication with humans and might occasionally show up on request, but Stephen Greer is not one of those people. In my opinion, he's a liar who hoaxes UFO events in order to gain fame, money, and attention. He enlists others in helping bring about events like the 2015 Vero Beach encounter, and so not only can we not trust him on UFO matters, we can't rely on the word of the people around him. And Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the viewers and listeners? We'll have a link to Aaron Gullius's book, Extraterrestrials and the American Zeitgeist. Also, Aaron Gullius's podcast, The Saucer Life, which is a lot of fun. So check it out. We'll have a link to Dr. J. Allen Hynek's book, The UFO Experience, where he breaks down the different kinds of encounters. Also, a documentary that we mentioned of Stephen Greer's, The Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind documentary from 2020, as well as another uh, documentary he released in 2017 called Unacknowledged, and a TV series he released in 2021 called Disclosure. We'll also have a 2013 documentary from him called Sirius. We'll have a link to his webpage, the Sirius Disclosure page. Also, we'll have his page on Wikipedia, a link to the Executive Summary of Disclosure Project Briefing document, the article from the Washington Examiner, Did Stephen Greer Fake a UFO with Flares? Uh, The interview from Ed Mitchell, being unhappy with Greer using his name as a disclosure witness, the James Woolsey letter rebutting Greer's account of the dinner conversation that he represented as a briefing, also the customer review from the CSETI workshop attendee and another workshop attendee account, also the video I mentioned of a YouTuber who wants to believe Greer but is reviewing his images of aliens and finding them unconvincing, 
we'll have the video uh, from Greer's own channel on YouTube of the 2015 Vero Beach CE5 encounter, as well as a link to his photo and video evidence page, information on the Atacama skeleton, and finally, information on light painting. Excellent. Very good. So, Jimmy, what mysterious headlines do we have for this week? This week, we have a theme dealing with the sun. And there's a lot of interesting stuff that you might not suspect with the sun. Uh, Recent evidence suggests that Earth may have acquired some of its water from the sun. Not necessarily in the way you might think. For a long time, there's been speculation that the oceans of Earth, all the water we have here, rode in on like comets and asteroids that hit us during the formation of the solar system. But there's some new evidence based on uh, studying the solar wind, that stream of charged particles that comes from the sun, that it actually may be creating water in space from other molecules and blowing them towards Earth. So we may have acquired some of our water from the sun. Also, uh, there's been a bit of a milestone in solar research. Uh, A spacecraft has gotten close enough to the sun to enter its upper atmosphere, and so it's the first time a spacecraft is credited with actually touching the sun, and you definitely want to wear your oven mittens for that. Um, And then finally, do dark matter asteroids cause solar flares? Because if dark matter exists, it might clump together and and form dark matter asteroids that interact gravitationally, but not uh, other ways with the universe. And some scientists have calculated how common, if they exist, how common these dark matter asteroids would be and how often we would expect them to smack into the sun. And since they do interact gravitationally, they would disturb the solar medium and could cause a flare. And they've even figured out, they hope, a way to d- distinguish between ordinary flares and dark matter asteroid flares. So um, it, they're they're looking, they're planning projects, they're looking at old data, and they're trying to see if we have evidence of dark matter asteroids smacking into the sun, which would, if that's true, provide evidence for the existence of dark matter and even more cool evidence for the existence of dark matter asteroids. That's awesome. Dark matter asteroids. All right. Thank you very much for those headlines. Folks, that's it from us. We would love to hear from you. What are your theories and conclusions about Dr. Stephen Greer and his claim to be able to physically summon UFOs? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page or sending an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we're going to be looking at things that go bump in the night, specifically the noisy ghosts known as poltergeists and the things that could cause them. Excellent. Folks, be sure to join the StarQuest fan club by texting StarQuest to 66866. That's StarQuest to 66866. That's one word, StarQuest. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Amagara Marungi, as Africa has become a leading source of priests to support the church in the United States, Amagama Marungi reciprocates by sending financial support. As they've supported our spiritual needs, we support the physical needs of the poor, orphans, widows, and elderly of these communities that have sent their sons to us. You can join their mission of bringing a better life to these communities by visiting amagaramarungi.org or sqpn.com slash helpafrica. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us a mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. You should never trust anything Stephen Greer says. 